and I who lead the business have never had any formal training in terms of leadership, etc. And, and culture and culture is almost this thing. It's like, what does it actually mean? But as you say, there is it's a feeling. It isn't something you can buy your way into or manufacture. It's just a feeling, and I think that emanates from those that lead the business. That was Jeff Webster. I'm Ben Morton, and this is your podcast. The Ben Morton Leadership Podcast is the weekly show that brings you inspiring interviews with global thought leaders, MDs, and CEOs. Sometimes those people will be from big global brands, and other times they'll be everyday leaders who you've possibly never heard of. No matter what the case, in every episode, I guarantee there will be something for you to learn and take away that will help you be an even better leader. In today's episode, we are talking with Jeff Webster, a Forbes 30 under 30 recognized leader who is the co-founder and chief operations officer at the inspired lifestyle brand Hunter & Gather. In this episode, amongst other things, we are talking about the transition from working in a big corporation to a startup or from a startup into a big corporation and the lessons to be learned from that, whether we are a leader or a hiring manager bringing people in or whether it's us ourselves making that career move. We're talking about the good old concept of work-life balance but we're taking a new take on it. We're looking at it as a pendulum more than the traditional seesaw. We're looking at Jeff's entrepreneurial journey, deciding when to quit or keep going with a project or an idea that we're working on, and also the true and practical purpose and value of having a purpose. Plus, as always, lots, lots more. So that is it by way of an introduction, folks. Let's dive straight in and please enjoy my interview with Jeff Webster from Hunter & Gather. Jeff, can we start off by me asking you to talk about your very first leadership experience and sort of what you remember of that and how it's gone on to shape you as a leader now? Yeah, for sure. I think it was back when we were hiring our first team members and we was hiring candidates from real big food companies. And we was about two or three million pound revenue at that stage. And the real imposter syndrome set in and was like, we're hiring these people from these massive big food companies to come work for our small little challenger brand. So I think that was when the wheels were a bit wobbly for me. And I reached out to one of our mentors and, and he said, in this kind of leadership and management thing, he said, as long as you care, 90 or 95% of caring about the individuals and caring about people, if you've got that, which Jeff, you have that in abundance, he said to me, you'll be absolutely fine. So that kind of set any nerves aside and, and enabled me to, to push on with, with being that leader that really cares and has empathy. So yeah, that was the real kind of turning point for me. So before the business, before we launched Hunter and Gavel, I didn't manage anyone. I didn't have a background of leadership in business at all. So it's really been learning on a job during kind of the ascendancy of Hunter and Gather. So who who was that mentor? Because it sounds like they were a great mentor, right? And I I love that advice that they gave. That's something I talk about all the time, just empathy and caring and really remembering that every single person we lead, right, is the most important person in the world to somebody else. They don't just work for us. They've got friends and family and loved ones, husband, wife, partner, or, or whatever. So understanding that and the impact that we have is is really key. And it sounds like kind of you was really fortunate to have a, a mentor who gave you some great counsel early on. Yeah, it's a guy called Chris Green, and he's only actually a few years older than me, but comes from a similar background, albeit up in, up in the northeast of England. And he was working within a business that we was actually a customer of, so they provided services to, to our business, um, like outsource supply chain services. And he had a team of about 25 or 30 at that stage. So it's kind of leaning on his experiences. And I'll shout, shout him out. His name's Chris Green. He's now a CEO of um, a huge company that are doing great things in kind of the um, cell regeneration side of things. 
But it was, yeah, that, that simple bit of advice just saying about caring. And it's interesting, actually, because our lead investors now who have really put a lot into our business and backed not only the mission and the vision, but us as individuals, Grant, who actually sits on our board, once sat down and said to us, when, when we bring new people into the business and we hire new people, what is that conversation that they go home that evening and have with their loved ones, their friends, their family? And, and what is that first yeah, feeling they get about the business? So always frame it in that way. How can you welcome someone into the business? How can you show that care, that empathy, that, that warmth? So it's always, yeah, that's always front of mind when we make decisions or we bring new people into the business or we, we make decisions. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, Jeff, actually. And it, it really resonates with something a guest on a previous episode, Erica Sinner, who I, I think was episode 167, and we'll drop a link in the show notes for people to go and listen to that as well. But she had a really nice way of describing culture, which sounds like it's in tune with your thoughts as well. And I'd never heard anybody describe culture like this before, but she said culture is how people feel on a Sunday night. And that, that really stuck with me because many of us have probably experienced it, right? I used to call it Sunday night syndrome, that feeling where you're trying to enjoy the last of your weekend with your friends or family or whatever, but your mind just starts to think about work and it starts spo spooling up. And if that's inducing any sort of anxiety or dread that's taking us away from enjoying the rest of our weekend, like there's something wrong there I, th I think yeah for sure and I th there's always going to be occasions where there's anomalies within the journey the journey isn't just rainbows and sunshine absolutely but yeah. if that's a feeling that's recurring every single week yeah there's something wrong and it's it's an interesting one about culture amy and i who lead the business have never had any formal training in terms of leadership etc and and culture and culture is almost this thing it's like what does it actually mean but as you say there it's it's a feeling it isn't something you can buy your way into or manufacture. It's just a feeling. And I think that emanates from those that lead the business. Yeah, I, lo I love that. There's so many things I want to want to ask you, and you've touched on quite a few of them already. But going back to your piece there around sort of those slight feelings of imposter syndrome, when you were starting to bring in some big hitters from much more of the well-established established brands, I think you have some really interesting insights to share that would be relevant for other leaders in your position who are doing that, but also for some of those, in inverted commas, big hitters who are maybe going from a big corporate, maybe into more of a more of a startup, because it, it's interesting both ways, right? I think those people joining a, a, a startup, they're coming from somewhere where there is lots of process and systems to follow and they can sometimes find it hard because they're taking a lot of that big business knowledge and they can get frustrated that it that it doesn't doesn't exist so like what were perhaps some of the the challenges you experienced in terms of integrating those people into the business getting the best from them and what solutions have you have you found along the way i think the biggest challenge is really are the internal narrative within our own minds particularly in mine right and it was that imposter syndrome because on the outside we had fantastic structure set up we had sop set up we had an onboarding process set up we had fantastic growth within the business so i think it was it was more a mindset issue as much as that sounds like a cliche because every time we've brought these quote unquote big hitters into the business they've been blown away by the onboarding process the wonderful mix between self-guided onboarding versus sessions with other team members, sessions with ourselves. So I think, it, yeah, that internal dialogue was a, the biggest challenge. And I think that's always something that we'll, or I in particular, work on and, and do self-work self, self -work and self-development, et cetera, to explore that and to remove those obstacles that do stand in the way. I think for the candidates coming into the business, it's bringing elements of that corporate structure and knowing that you have a significant amount of value to bring the business, but sometimes you need to meet the business in the middle. You can't just come straight in and say, hey, we need to be doing it this way. You need to assess why something's being done a particular way, why there might not be a, such a rigidness that exists within the organization. A lot of startups and challenger brands like us need to remain super agile, and that's kind of in our favor. But we enjoy the structure that these wonderful people bring we see it in our minds as they kind of 
draw the business up rather than us having to push. So um, and I think, yeah, there's a tremendous amount that can be, be learned each side. Hey, quick interruption. You've just heard Jeff and myself talking about the leader's mindset and how we can overcome that imposter syndrome that creeps in for many of us from time to time. Well, if you want to take your leadership and the leadership across your entire organization to a new level, then do check out the keynote speaking section of my website and then drop me a line at chat at ben-morton.com so we can have a conversation how I can come in and help you and all the leaders in your organization to be the very best leader they can possibly be. I'll share with you why human connection really is the true currency of leadership and just how far people will go for us when we invest the time in getting to know them. As I say, go and check out the keynote speaking section of my website. Back to the episode. And you mentioned how a lot of it is mindset and about our inner narrative and, and mind talk. And that's something that you've done a lot of work on. Like, can you share some of the specific things you've done that you've found useful to help help you manage that? Because imposter syndrome in all its different guises and the different places where it might show up, it, it's really common, right? I don't think I've probably spoke to a single leader for this podcast, 160 plus episodes in, who, who's not referenced it either in the recording or in sort of our preparation calls. So yeah, what is some of the stuff that you've personally done to help you manage and overcome that mindset yeah my nature is I'm a super reflective person and I'm inquisitive so reading books listening to podcasts speaking to peers enjoying moments of solitude I think solitude is super important to to get rid of inputs so inputs are important to enable us to learn and to spark creative ideas but then to have moments of quietness and stillness and solitude be it a two-hour bike ride, be it a two-hour run, be it a walk with the dogs, and just to allow things to settle down so you can actually have clarity of mind. That's super important for me, and that works really well for me as an individual. I've not really done anything formal. It's all just been self-journey, self-journaling, and yeah, and just listening to myself as in as an individual. And how do you find the time to do all of that, right? Being a entrepreneur business owner when you're really trying to scale and grow a business especially one that you are deeply passionate about it's flipping busy right like where and there'll be lots of people listening going oh yeah that's great not not nice one jeff but you should come and do my job i'm super busy i've not got time to i'd, I'd love to read a book like not a chance and i've got two kids it's never going to happen like how do you make the time for that because that that's what it's about right if you i guess if you value it you you make the time but how do you go about doing that yeah let's let's just rewind there that is kind of a, a seven or eight year journey okay of of discovery put into a 20 second soundbite so <laughs> i'm not doing all those things every day every week every month every year there will be points i think balance is almost a fallacy as well where people say you, you can have it all in in one week and you must seek balance there, it's almost like a pendulum a pendulum swing Sometimes you really over index on exploring these things and you go really hard on it for a month and you just you commit everything to it. And other times you don't listen to any content, you don't read any books, you don't do any solitude because you just haven't got the chance to. Yeah. But I think it's important to to carve out those moments when you zoom out on a long enough time horizon rather than today, this hour, this morning, today. I think that's important to note because yeah, life gets in a way, it really does. And that's why it's important maybe to, to journal or to, to look back and take moments of reflection to see where you've come on that journey. I love that, especially your comment around zooming out. Like that resonates in, in so many different, different ways for me. And your point around balance, I think, is, is bang on as well. I tend to run and live my, my life and business in, in, in three month blocks. I'm always creating not 90 day plans. And in, in some ways, I'm maybe a bit of an extreme character, but I was chatting with a lead, leadership group just, the, just this week, actually, and was doing a lot of work around personal values and how they can just be so valuable in terms of maintaining balance and making difficult decisions. And one of the things I shared with the group that, some of them sort of chuckled out and raised an eyebrow, but I've got all of my sort of core values written down in the front of a, of a journal. 
with a couple of really specific and granular bullet points for each one, it really explaining what that that means to me. And one of the things I do is I've got a recurring three monthly appointment with myself in my diary where I sit and review my values and I score myself out of five on on each one. And what that does is it lets me adjust that balance over a longer term horizon. So if for a period like I've really been going kind of hard in the business to land a new project or something, then I see that through my values and go, okay, actually, like family, I need to dial that up and put a little bit more focus there over the over the next quarter. So I think balance day to day, week by week is a fallacy. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and no, I love that. We we actually operate with like a 90 day world too. We we try to stick to kind of, I'm not sure if you've heard it, the traction or the EOS model within the business. No, I've not. We kind of use rocks and a 90 day world view. But personally, what you mentioned there, I must confess, I've been trying to work towards that structure for the last three years and I've not made it stick because everything you say there resonates with me as an individual and that's what I could be doing. Don't like to use the word should, but that's what I could be doing and that's what I'm aiming towards. So um, yeah, it's great to hear you're using that and that might be the the catalyst I need to actually implement that. Uh, Brilliant, brilliant. I want to talk a little bit about your backstory as well jeff i um, really enjoyed sort of doing some research and reading a few of the the articles on your on your linkedin profile so you grew up in in dagenham same place where my mum grew up and just up the road from from my childhood home so europe's biggest council estate it says you went to a comprehensive school that was in special measures and were frequently called defiant and then in your word, you said you could quite easily have ended up in, in prison like some of your classmates. But then fast forward to 2021, you're in the Forbes 30 under 30 list. I'm really interested. Do you think you have been successful because of that star in life or despite it? I think it fuels me. I don't think it's because of I think it fuels me at certain times and provides motivation But I think from a young age, it's a cliche, but from a young age, I felt different to my peers. I felt there was something, I viewed the world around me slightly differently. You could call it a fish out of water. But yeah, there was almost a feeling of, nope, I'm going to remain focused in the moment. So I need to remain focused. I need to achieve certain things at certain times, hit certain milestones. But yeah, I wouldn't say it was because of. It's it's more of a that it, it provides fuel for the fire as we go along. But with that, it also comes with great difficulties too, because again, it adds to that imposter syndrome. It adds to why are you here doing that? Not only friends went to prison from school, but my actual biological father went to prison when I was two years old as well. So it's interesting when you look back and and you see, oh, I, I could have become a statistic, just like friends and family had become. So. Yeah, it's not a get the violin out moment. It's just the reality and a fact of the situation, but also is fascinating to look back on. Yeah. And what were some of the behaviours or traits that led some of those teachers, I guess, to label or describe you as defiant? I questioned everything. So I had a, had a, a yearning for knowledge and understanding. And if logic or a decision didn't make sense from authority, with you know teachers the management i was the kid that would say why is that how how comes we're doing that and if anyone ever says to me just because like geez it's like a it's like a red red rag to a bull i I crave substantiation and justification always have done since a young age i want to know how things work why is it done like this and that's fed into what we do as a business in terms of how we're trying to revolutionize and redefine the food system and provide products that really question that conventional wisdom and and status quo. But I think that was, yeah, the main thing I would be called at school is defiant. And my business studies teacher, um, Mr. Date, Phil Date, we still still communicate now. He had his own business and went into teaching at the age of 50. And he was kind of a big inspiration for me when I was 14 or 15. I could I could see what he'd achieved and what he was what knowledge and wisdom he was trying to impart on us students. And at parents even he'd say to my parents, one moment, he's an absolute delight. The next moment, he's a nightmare. But that was just because I would want to question things and I guess not conform. You could say the education system is is set up and in place 
for the majority. And I think when you're a business owner or a business founder or an entrepreneur, unfortunately, you're not in the majority. Your, your brain almost, I think, works in a different way. And I guess the attributes and characteristics were quite prominent from a young age, which meant I probably probably did stand out and probably was defiant and probably did have a different behavior set to my peers. I've not thought about it in that way before. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. It reminds me of, like, it's one of my favorite TED Talks. And again, I was, I was playing it just this week to a group, but the one with Sean Aker from Harvard, where he's talking about the the happiness advantage. And he, he shares a graph on it, which is, he, he says very amusingly, is, is made up data. But basically, he's talking about if you ask any sort of academic or, or scientist, like how does a child learn to read and write? He said, scientists and academics will immediately change the question to how does the average kid learn to read and write? He said, then we tailor everything we do to, to the average. And if you are above that kind of average line in terms of your intellectual abilities, your creativity, your sporting abilities, then actually you're frequently going to get labeled difficult or defiant or whatever because you're, you're challenging and you're pushing and you're stretching against it and you and you want to to know why and it's really it's a, it's a brilliant ted talk he says instead of sort of wanting to delete those people and make them conform he want, really wants to study them and understand so then how can we move other people like shift the whole average up and just dramatically improve performance in in our businesses and, and society and it just strikes me you are perhaps one of those little red dots on his graph that is sitting above the above the average um yeah really interesting yeah we see it time and time again in society be it with a marathon running plan that's in runner's world for instance that's going to be created for the average and an old running coach said to me who actually run for team Ireland. He said, these running plans are made for everybody, but are good for nobody. Yeah, love that. And you see it even with lab results, you know, like lipid blood results, for instance, from, from, from doing some self-evaluation. You see an average. Well, that, the average is, in that scenario, quite a sick population. Yeah. So if you're within that, you're almost you suboptimal. So there's many ways of framing that. So, yeah. I love that assessment and I'll, I'll seek out that TED talk post this uh, chat. Yeah, we'll st I'll stick the link in the show notes for everybody listening as well. Um, but Jeff, th there was another article I saw on your, your LinkedIn that really re resonated with me. And I guess it's another story of persistence or to use that word that some of your teachers used, uh, d defiance. Like you said, a lot of the so-called experts said that you'd never make it on the high street as a business. You'd never make it sort of getting in and selling through retailers like Holland and Barrett here in, in the UK. And you very nearly didn't, right? I think you said, was it one of your um, sort of distributors went, went bust and you lost a hell of a lot of money. But you didn't see that as a failure, right? You and your co-founder, Amy, you said, saw that as, a, as fuel or another reason to, to keep going and, and try again. So with that as the backdrop, how do you, you and Amy, decide when to keep going and when to keep pushing with an idea and, and when to stop? Because I get asked this all the time and I've personally got stories both ways. I've got some where I refuse to quit and it's paid off. And I've got other stories where I refuse to quit because I've probably got quite a stubborn nature. And looking back now, arguably, I, I should have quit maybe 18 months, two years earlier on that particular project. And people often ask me, how do you know? How do you know whether to keep going or call it a day? And I I can never come up with a great answer. Like, so I'm hoping you can. Don't expect one from me. I think it's that intuition piece that comes with the attributes of an entrepreneur um, or business owner. You develop this intuition, this gut feeling. Does it pass the sniff test? You look out for these signals. I'm not sure you can put it onto paper. It's not a formula. Yeah. We live in such a way that everyone expects a formulaic response to be able to do it, a, a checkbox of doing something. But I think that's part of the magic, yeah, the magic co combination or magic formula that makes up the attribute set of people like us who run businesses or lead businesses. Mm. I don't have a good answer. 
Sometimes you just feel it's the right thing to do or sometimes you feel it's not the right thing to do. Just like animals have, you know, we observe animals in, in nature, they've got a sixth sense. We can learn from wolves, for instance, how they can sense that animals that they're looking, you know, that the prey they're looking, they identify. There's almost a relationship between the wolf and the, the prey. Yeah. The prey sometimes even commits itself to that process because it knows it's the weakest one in that herd. Does that apply to us as humans? Probably. Mm. But we look to like the, the peer-reviewed scientific literature and say, well, is that evidence-based? Oh, well, no, it's not. We, we Some things you just can't study. Some things you just can't put your finger on and, and determine and define. So I think intuition is a is a big thing and listens, listens to that gut feeling. But then there's also sunk, the sunk cost fallacy too, right? You can come back to that and be like, okay, we've put so much into this, so we must keep going. But you've already put so much into it anyway. That's gone. There's a reason. It's a cliche, but I love I love it. There's a reason the rear view mirror is so much smaller than the, the windscreen in a car, right? <laughs> it's important to look going forward. So... Yeah, I think sunk cost fallacy informs a lot of our decisions and listening to our intuition as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's really interesting hearing you say that. And almost you're helping me formulate my own answer to this as well. I think part of it is probably due as well that if you are a entrepreneur or entrepreneurial minded, right, you get a lot of people with real entrepreneurial spirit who work within big organizations. Like my, my wife is one of those for sure. I think what one of the distinguishing factors about those sorts of people is probably a slightly higher risk appetite. So you're probably willing to keep pushing a little bit because you, you see the potential upside if it, if it does work out, but then probably the flip side is as well. And not necessarily because people deliberately hide it and talk about it less, but there will always be stories where you pursue a goal and and it doesn't work out. Right. But the nature of our world is people tend to hear about the stories where you kept going, you kept pushing and it, and it come good, but I I, I don't hide them, but I don't talk that much online about all the various projects where I've kept going and they've been, been an utter failure commercially. Although there's very little I view as a failure because you're always learning examples from it that you can, apply next time or to the next similar similar project but i guess reality is not all ideas do work out do they absolutely not and yeah we we try to frame it as fail fast or learn fast that was one thing we was taught early on yeah in our journey by by another mentor talking about fail fast what does that actually mean but we see every every quote unquote failure as a learning opportunity as long as you learn from it otherwise it's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, learning opportunities are all around us at all times. We live in a society now where things are at such extremes. You either see the huge successes, so you've got the success bias. And I think more so recently, you've also got the, the failure bias as well. So you've got two ends of this spectrum. So people only ever see the real successes or the real failures and you don't realize there's like many rungs along in that spectrum. So you can create a fantastically successful business that may not be at the far end of the success spectrum, but you're going to achieve wonderful things. When we first started our business, friends and family said, well, you know, who's going to buy that, that mayonnaise? There's, there's plenty of other mayonnaise out there. Who's, who's going to buy that product or uh, someone else is going to do it. And it's only because they're dialed into Dragon's Den or The Apprentice and see these far end of the spectrum, these extremes, they don't see all the other options available. So I think that puts a lot of people off actually embarking and harnessing their entrepreneurial spirit as well. I've gone a bit off a topic with a question there, but I think it's important to raise that. There's two ends of the spectrum that are prominent in between. It's kind of lost its grayscale. Yeah, you, you, you bang on. And I think what's also as well is the... I guess it's because as humans, we have a inbuilt negativity bias, right? Which has made us successful as a species and kept us alive. But we can dial in and listen much more to the to the negatives and the and the naysayers. Like when I started my business in 2012, 2013, the amount of really nice people, close friends and contacts and colleagues I'd worked with in business all told me it was a stupid idea worst possible time to start a business you must be mad and i just chose not not to listen to them but it was it was quite compelling it's quite hard to ignore it um but i was like 
there's, surely there's there's never a good time but we do have this negativity bias don't we for sure i almost yeah if 90 percent of people around me are saying it's a bad idea i'm like great i'm doing something right <laughs> yeah 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 love it brilliant <laughs> it's a bit playful but yeah jeff i want to come back to something we touched on earlier around sort of um new hires and bringing bringing people into to the business which i think is interesting because it strikes me that you are a very purpose driven driven business right you're not just making any mayonnaise you're making mayonnaise for for a reason and with passion and and purpose so for such a purpose driven business what's your approach and how do you sort of balance the seesaw when you're faced with maybe a new hire with incredible business related job specific skills and experience who perhaps isn't such a massive advocate of your purpose and mission like what do you do in those situations which takes um, primacy for you yeah first and foremost they need to have a skill set that is applicable to the role because ultimately for us to have the impact on the world that we we know we can have and that we're having we need to make sure the business is functioning as a business without that you're on a hiding to nothing then it comes down to if the individual has passion for the lifestyle too fantastic amazing but it's quite difficult to find people with the applicable supply chain operational financial even sales background that are highly passionate about the nuances of what we advocate as a business but that then goes on to the next layer or the next filter is their appetite and curiosity and integrity as an individual and their desire to want to learn and the questions that they ask within the interview process. The questions a candidate asks is more important to me than how they answer the questions that we ask. So I think, yeah, I think what, what they're looking to learn from us in that process is, is super important and, and that feeds into my intuition on a particular candidate and interestingly amy and i have a very joined up intuition when it comes to many things be it business decisions be it candidates be it most things in life so we we make a great team in that regard but yeah i think it's it's the it's the person's attitude and appetite to learn to ask questions and their curiosity talking of curiosity this is purely out of curiosity what are some of the best questions you've been asked then by a candidate in an interview are there any that really sort of stand out that sort of blew you away it's like wow flipping heck that's a that's a great question is there anything that sticks in your mind yeah and i actually use it myself now when i'm asking when i'm screening new suppliers or speaking to anyone really that are looking to sell us something it's not hugely compelling when you're looking to bring on a new team member and their candidates you're almost selling them the business too but it's simply what are you guys doing that's currently not going well like what are you looking to to improve on what is a skeleton in the closet and just have that kind of transparency on the table that was a good one and that's one that's informed many of the questions that we ask on the other side that's a great one and and how do if you ask that question to potential suppliers as well how do they generally respond to that i guess like anything you're going to get a, a spectrum some that respond quite well and i'm assuming you get some who are quite uncomfortable almost do the political thing trying to trying to not answer it will they i always drop it in at a particular time as well when it feels right so they're, they're like they've been on this kind of you know 10 20 30 minute kind of sales pitch and i drop it in and you can almost see like not a rabbit in the headlights but the handbrake comes up and they're like whoa and nine times out of ten i typically get that is a great question and no one asks me that and then you kind of you put the sales spiel aside and you start having a proper conversation about because I'm fascinated by how other businesses are run oh, love it. and their processes and and what keeps them up up at night or you know what what they're trying to go through because anyone can tell you the good stuff but it's like well, what's the bad stuff let's manage expectations here and understand how we can help potentially solve them as as a yeah. customer of yours or just go into it with with all cards on the table so I think yeah typically it's responded with with a sense of humor but also it brings down that barrier and it's almost an icebreaker. Yeah, I, I love that. It's almost a brilliant way to like rip off the armor, right? And pull off the pull off the mask and really get to know each other as individuals and really get into each other's each other's businesses. And I'm sensing, I think you're probably quite quite like me. And 
the the individuals and companies that don't want to to go there are probably the individuals and companies you you don't want to work with yourself right exactly so we're we're proud of the suppliers we work with 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 our team the people it's all about relationships and if you can't have that candid honest glass of wine type conversation it's too transactional brilliant love that love that it's my favorite bit of the conversation so far jeff finally i know there's lots going on i know you've got big ambitions and grow, growing the business so what's what what's new what's on the horizon for hunter and gather yeah so again we don't talk about the failures or the learnings too often but just this week of recording this podcast, we pulled a new launch of a product. It was an existing product going into a different format, but we made the bold decision. We're a great believer in hard choices, easy life. Most people want to take the easy choice and have a hard life. But at the 11th hour, we said, guys, we don't think this is right. And we had you know buy-in from team on this decision. But we pulled a product and that's going to gonna wait until later in the year now, once we've kind of reformulated and, and it meets our exceptional kind of standards for excellence but hopefully at the time of this podcast going live we'd have launched our restore um sorry our restore i always get pulled up by the brand team <laughs> I, I, I default back into my my upbringing in dagenham and saying restore but it's called restore and it's the world world's first unsweetened electrolyte formula which has got magnesium potassium and sodium so we live in a world now where we've got mineral depletion within soil. We've got many people that live more of a low carb ketogenic lifestyle. And sometimes the body gets rid of kind of salt and sodium and, and essential minerals. So we've created this fantastic product called Restore and it comes in three flavors, three types. One is raw. So it's literally just sodium from pink Himalayan salt, potassium from potash um, salt and magnesium from from natural seawater so it's a, a scientifically formulated um blend that goes in in a sachet goes into a drink people that exercise would love it people that just want to restore their minerals first thing in the morning will love it so yeah that's the raw flavor we then have lemon and lime and we have mixed berry so hopefully by the time this goes live that'll be out in the wild and people will be loving it so that's what's new for us Ah, amazing. So I've got a big cycling challenge coming up in June. So if it's on the shelves or on your website by then, I'll uh, I'll get some, check it out and report back to, to listeners on uh, on what I thought of it. We'll get you something out. Amazing. I, I wasn't plugging for you to do that, but, uh, <laughs> but amazing. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a really fascinating conversation, sort of really learning, I guess, about your personal journey and the, and the business journey. And What's been really interesting about it is I think there's so much from this conversation that people can take and use, whether they are a leader in a similar situation to you, or if they are someone coming in to, to work in a business like yours or, or a startup business. So yeah, once again, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed chatting with you and appreciate you sharing all of your, your knowledge, wisdom and insights.